Hey everyone, and welcome to The Private Podcast, where we plug in and explore the intersection of privacy, human rights, technology, and democracy. I'm your host, Derek E. Silva. Today, we're speaking with Dmitry Nemirovsky. Dmitry is the COO of Atacama, an innovative data security company that provides a file-level encryption solution like nothing else available on the market. Before becoming a serial entrepreneur, uh, Dimitri spent 15 years practicing law, representing some of the world's largest financial services firms on matters that regularly made the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I guess I'll forgive you in advance, considering your your uh, pivot <laughs> towards file encryption. <laughs> I'll absolve you on behalf of the entire pri private podcast audience. Uh, Atacama was also the first to file. Uh, no, maybe not for Atacama. His company was also the first to file with the SEC for a proper Bitcoin ETF back in 2015. Uh, Dimitri, thanks for taking the time to be here today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. No problem. Maybe we should clear that up. Which which company was that? Was that Atacama that filed for the So ETF? Atacama is, uh, yeah, no, it was a different company. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, that was ancient history, just like my legal practice and past is, you know, ancient history. So I found well, my way. That's that's fine. It's still innovative, yeah. especially at the time of 2015. Like that was really early. Yeah. Uh, two yeah. years before before I discovered, I was probably about the time I discovered it, Bitcoin. But it was two years before I discovered everything else uh, happening, yeah. which is which pretty much all came yeah. after anyway. So. Yeah. Um, anyway, let let's get into that background and what led you to data security. Uh, I understand you were a lawyer for a time. We just talked about that. How did you get from from there to here? Yeah. So, you know, took my first coding class in eighth grade. Uh, absolutely loved it. Uh, you know, basic uh, Pascal Fortran tells you how old I am. Um, <laughs> I think there's like, you know, maybe 18 people in the world that still know what Fortran is. But um, and they are, you know, well obviously. Paid. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> it's a in demand commodity, especially for the government. But, um, you know, I lost my way at some point, obviously went to law school, business school, and ended up practicing law for a number of years, representing, as you mentioned, um, the large firms on the street. And what's interesting is, you know, I, I, I started my practice uh, during the dot-com era, and that's really where I sharpened my teeth and uh, really was enamored with the technology, not, not so much the trading aspect of it, but the fact that this new thing was happening, right? Um, and, and really, if you look at the dot-com era, it's it's transformed our world today, right? And it, it, it's what led to things like Amazon being normal, right? Mm -hmm. Like everyone knows what Amazon is, but back in the day, in the late 90s, um, you know, e-commerce was new. And to me, this electronic landscape uh, was totally, you know, really, really interesting. And a lot of my early practice focused on the Wall Street firms and a lot of these companies, not necessarily from a technical standpoint, um, you know, it was obviously a, 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 a capital formation standpoint, but um, it drew me to these companies because I, you know, these were all um, technology companies and I had to understand the technology. And what's interesting and what you discover fairly early on in your career as an attorney is lawyers, when it comes to technology, are laggards, even to, you know, this day. Um, I was, I was considered the tech guy at my firm because I knew how to, uh, create a PowerPoint deck and, uh, you know, uh, run an Excel spreadsheet and they were de facto like, Oh, that guy's technical. He knows the stuff. And it really did, uh, you know, create this trajectory for me in the legal practice where I was always on the forefront of tech in the legal arena. And, um, given my interest, uh, in the dot com, uh, you know, landscape, uh, I, I got into Bitcoin early. Obviously, I, I didn't buy enough Bitcoin, or maybe I sold too soon, maybe a combination of both. both yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, ultimately, I looked at that blockchain technology, and to me, similar enamoration because it was just like, oh my God, this is incredible the underpinnings of it. And in a way, I, I you, you can consider me a Bitcoin maximalist, um, but I appreciate some of the other stuff. But to me, it's it's Bitcoin or bust uh, when it comes to, you know, the blockchain world. But um, um, what was interesting when I got involved in Bitcoin, this was the, you know, I would say it was around 2013, where I started going to meetups and conferences and events and whatnot. And what was interesting uh, most people looked like I look now, right? T-shirt, mm -hmm. you know, you, oh, you probably work out of your parents' basement, you know, kind of thing. Have I came in and maybe a few, <laughs> exactly, you know, whereas I was shaving twice a day. 
Um, and <laughs> what was funny was there were a few of us who were, you know, quote unquote, uh, institutional guys, right? From Wall Street, either from the banking side or the legal side or something else. And we would congregate. We were the guys in the suits, literally. Um, and that's where I met my co-founder. And we slowly started, you know, talking about what we can do in the space. And that's where I said to myself, you know what, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I'm going to um, abandon the law. I'm still admitted technically, but I don't, you know, I don't practice. I've been clean for about 4,628 days. I have a sponsor. Um, so I'm quite proud of that. Um, but uh, yeah, I went full on into the blockchain space. And that way you mentioned the Bitcoin ETF. We were, it was us and the Winklevoss. Um, and, you know, many meetings with the SEC, um, they just don't get it still to this day, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it also caused us to develop on a comma. How? Well, understanding the Bitcoin blockchain universe and how the Bitcoin blockchain works, the public private key pairings and the fact that you as an individual can um, really secure, an, a, you know, an infinite value uh, on this Bitcoin blockchain and you yourself have the authority and control over it, that's really unique because most yeah. everything else in our lives, there's a central intermediary, right? When we go into a Starbucks, for example, and we pay for a coffee with our debit card, Starbucks isn't, you know, looking at us and saying, wait, 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 slow down, buddy. I don't know that you have the five dollars that you're, you know, you're going to pay for this coffee. So let me do a background check and let me mm -hmm. see that you really, you know, that would be silly, right? What they yeah. do is they're they're not facing me. They're facing the bank that stands behind my debit card. But with Bitcoin and the Bitcoin blockchain, basically, I can send you that value without that central authority. And that was just amazing uh, to me from a, t a tech standpoint. And, you know, fast forward when we started thinking to ourselves, well, what can we do with the blockchain? One of the things that we thought to ourselves was, well, in a way, we can split up passwords, the way that the blockchain uses private keys, mm -hmm. we can actually do that to passwords. And why passwords? Well, we use passwords on a daily basis. But passwords in the context of sharding those passwords can be applied to encryption in a very meaningful and profound way. Um, and I, I don't really want to get into that until you're ready to get into that and ask me some questions <laughs> about it. But that's really what led us to, you know, um, found Atacama. Um, it was inspired very much by the Bitcoin blockchain, but it does not rely on, on blockchain technology, but the inspiration really uh, drew itself from, from the Bitcoin, um, you know, universe. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I know of, I mean, I've, <clears throat> it sounds like you're just slightly older than me, uh, maybe in your early forties, I'm in my late thirties. So, uh, you know, we have, a, 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 fairly similar trajectory i didn't get into law seriously debated it seriously debated becoming a police officer as well obviously did not um maybe not obviously but i i did not end up going that route for a variety of reasons um but certainly like taking uh coding classes in high school where i got um i did turbo pascal instead of just pascal <laughs> so I'm just find you and visual basic six and okay. uh and stuff like that so yeah i was i was like maybe maybe five or six years behind you in, in that respect. Um, I totally get where you're coming from in, in the sense of like identifying this technology and having enough experience in the real world uh, or in the physical world, I'll say to, to know that, uh, uh, you know, having somebody in the way of being able to spend your money can be incredibly frustrating sometimes. And I have literally just been dealing with this with even like a, a, a visa debit card, which goes back to my checking account. I can't use it on some fiat on ramp providers to go from my dollars to Bitcoin, X die, whatever, right. because uh, according to the bank rep I spoke to, it's too risky. And I'm like, Visa literally just bought an NFT. Right. <laughs> like, why, what, so why, can't, why can't I yeah. do the same using my money across there? I don't, this is some massive cognitive dis dissonance happening here. Uh, so yes, absolutely. Being able to scan a QR code or, or plug something in and transfer value, uh, regardless of the way it happens, 
Ag- agreed. That was one of uh, a, that was a major light bulb moment for me. It did not buy any Bitcoin when I heard about it. Should have should have spent my life savings on it. But it's, um, uh, I'm doing okay now though. Fifty bucks was a big deal f- four years ago. It's no longer a big deal uh, to me now, as evidenced by the replica. Paris Saint Germain jersey that I just got last week, where I'm like, I'm just gonna buy one. Um, yeah, no, that's terrific. So uh, about Autocama specifically, uh, you call it a file level encryption tool. Um, you know, I I was trying to explain that I'm old enough to know uh, password protected WinZip files, WinRAR. Uh, you know, having to to download 50 WinRAR files and you make sure you extract the first one to get the rest of them done. Uh, uh, and stuff like that. And, um, even I was, I was working, you know, a, a really nice full-time job, uh, for Infotech Research Group when TrueCrypt had their mm-hmm. full disk encryption, uh, uh, solution kind of blown out of the water, uh, yeah. overnight by, by, uh, a presentation at Black Hat. Um, so I'm just curious, like, you know, we've come a long way, you know, file vault is like baked in now to, to Mac OS, uh, Windows has their Bit Defender, I think it's called. Bit uh, you know, Bit Locker. You yeah. know, uh, yeah. uh, full disk encryption. How does Atacama set it set itself apart from you know some of that FDE stuff and also from from other file level uh, encryption solutions? Yeah. So what's interesting, you know, your, your audience probably knows this, right? That encryption is with us, it, in, whether we know it or not. It's happening behind the scenes, right? Um, and and that's really cool from a UX UI standpoint. Right. We, we close our computer. The contents of the hard drive are, in fact, encrypted. And that's cool. Right. You leave your laptop behind somewhere. You don't want someone to be able to rip up, rip, rip out the, the hard drive and be able to access the contents. Mm-hmm. So, you know, full disk encryption, full volume encryption definitely ha- serves a purpose. But um, the issue with encryption is the following. Because we've made encryption so, quote unquote, seamless, so transparent to the end user, we've really diminished the power of encryption and the ability of encryption to protect the data that it has encrypted. And I want to be clear about something. Encryption algorithms, if you're using a NIST standard, like 256AS, right? Um, The encryption algorithm, that's lock stock. That's good. That's Mm baked. You you, you know, no one, whether you're an individual or a corporate entity or the government, um, you know, have military, you're not concerned about the encryption algorithm. You know, and we're gonna we're not gonna talk about quantum computing right now. Um, but <laughs> at the not, end of the day, it's a whole other one, right? Whole other one that's game. a whole. We could spend another forty five minutes on that. But um, you know, <laughs> the the fact that the algorithms are so secure that's separate and apart from the fact that once you've entered your login credentials, right? When you open your computer, when you open your computer this morning, when I open my computer this morning, and we logged in, whether we logged in using a biometric, uh, whether we logged in using a the traditional username and password, whether we use a multi-factor or a single sign-on solution, we've authenticated ourselves. We've proved to the system we are who we claim to be. Right. And when you've done that, it's binary. What happens is everything that you have access to is wholesale now decrypted, right? And if it's a corporate entity and whether the file store is on-prem or in the cloud, when you have hundreds or thousands of users who have logged in in the morning. Everything is wholesale decrypted. Why that sucks is because what what we're looking at and what we see today with respect to attacks, the attacks that are being perpetrated are mostly social engineering attacks, Mm -hmm. trying to compromise someone's credentials, Mm -hmm. trying to trick the system, the network into believing that this attacker is in fact this authorized user. And when that happens, everything that that authorized user has access to is available to the adversary. And the attacks that we're seeing now is they're siphoning the information, stealing it, exfiltrating it, right? And so, yeah, we had full disk encryption. We had full volume encryption. We had the central key store. All of that is fantastic, but it's very peripheral. Mm -hmm. It, it, It doesn't protect the information itself. We throw that on its head. Right. So we are by design disconnected from those identity and access management controls. So one of our security guarantees is when a user's credentials are compromised, anything encrypted by Atacama will remain encrypted. Anything that the adversary steals on a wholesale basis, the only thing they can steal, exfiltrate, is the encrypted version of the file. 
Right. And that's because instead of relying on those identity and access management controls or relying on a central key store or a central authority, we rely on distributed key management. And this goes back to the blockchain innovation, where when we encrypt something, we encrypt each file, each object with its own unique encryption key. And again, we're utilizing this, the AES with a 256 bit key. We then take that key and cut it up into pieces, key shards. Right, very similar to the blockchain, the public private key pair. Yeah. And we distribute those key shards to the physical devices controlled by the user. Mm -hmm. So a key shard lives with the file on the user's computer, and a key shard is sent for that file to the Atacama mobile app running on the user's smartphone. And when the user goes to open up a file, they get a prompt that looks and feels very much like a two factor. Yeah. And it's asking them, do you want to approve the opening of this file? And when they tap the big green button, literally, they're sending back a piece of the key shard, the key is reconstituted, and the file is decrypted. Okay. And so it's, it, you know, it's multi-factor, but at the object level. That sounds actually pretty cool. I've got a very similar, for anybody who's, who for any companies that have integrated Authy uh, natively, uh, which is, I think, owned by Twilio now. Um, mm -hmm. similar thing happens. They're using Authy. You've got the Authy two-factor authentication app. You actually get a prompt, and, and I, I can even get it on my on my Apple Watch of, hey, somebody's trying to log into this site. Do you want to, you know, is that you? Approve or deny? Approve, Approve right. is in yeah. green, deny is in red. Super easy. Literally just go boop on my phone and or on yeah. my watch uh, or my phone, and I'm in, which is terrific. Like, that's, that's exactly the type of uh, yeah. security I want on everything, at least a code, uh, you know, Authy is ideal because I can literally hit approve or deny instead of having to type in a six or seven digit code. But, uh, but regardless, it's, it's better, much better than having yeah. just a password and much better than having a password and SMS because of course, right. SIM jacking in, in and band. things like that no, happens, no good. Yeah. Yeah. which is, which is mostly perpetrated by social engineering as well. And, um, yeah, so I, I I love that the that you've applied this to to file level encryption. That's terrific. So I'm just curious if, if somebody doesn't have their mobile phone on them, you know, their smartphone, and therefore can't get to the app. Is there like a backup option? Is there a, a password or a set of uh, yeah. uh, randomly generated codes that they can ha copy down? Hopefully, in a password manager, yeah. you know, a, a, so another secure is, place. Yeah, this is a completely hypothetical question because when was the last time someone was without their smartphone? Um, that it doesn't happen very reality. often, but sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but of if, course, we've if I'm backpacking in the Grand Canyon, I'm probably not worried about it either. So yeah. exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we get that question sometimes from some of our commercial, um, you know, customers and I, I, I challenge it, you know, and the first question I ask is, are you using MFA? And their, their, their answer usually is yes. And I'm like, okay, how are you using MFA? Well, it's an app on the phone. I said, okay, so the, the, then my, my Atacama application becomes secondary to the user's ability to log into their machine in the first place. Right. Um, and they appreciate that because, you know, I like to, you know, bring things down to a practical level. And, you know, one time a woman said, yeah, you know, I left my phone at home. What would happen? And I said, can I ask you a question? What did you do when you left your phone at home? She goes, I turned my car around and went back and got my phone. Right, because that's the reality of it. But a real case, a real use case is, you know what? I left my phone behind in a cab, in an Uber, and mm -hmm. it's going to take the driver four hours to get back to me. And I am able to log into my, you know, machine. So, um, and I'm I'm giving you a response in the context of a company. Um, mm -hmm. So at a company, we do have redundancies baked in. Anything from a burner device that an IT admin professional can, mm -hmm. you know, give that person. So that they can, you know, access the files, or even better, and this is our preferred method: you turn to one of your coworkers back when you actually had a coworker sitting next to you pre-COVID, and you would say, "Hey, Scott, um, do me a favor. You're going to receive a request right now because I left my phone at home. Please approve it." And okay. we literally have built in a waterfall. And what I just described cannot be socially engineered because my coworker either knows me or they don't. I can't just randomly call someone up and say, "Hey, Scott, we've never met before." I work at your company. I sit on the eighth floor. You sit on the sixth floor. You're going to receive a request. Like, what are you talking about? Right? Yeah. <laughs> I either know you or I don't. Yeah. <laughs> because um, if you if you're so, at a desk, you might actually have like a wired desk phone. So I'm exactly. actually like hanging up. <laughs> yeah. What my kids don't know what, what what that is. You know, it's like I'm not. What, what's, what's this thing? My what's kids do, but only because their grandparents actually have like a wall, like a phone on the wall, plugged in. Right. Yeah. 
But uh, you know, from an uh, from an individual user standpoint, you know, if they're using our software, then when they onboard, we force them to onboard with multiple devices. So you can literally onboard with a tablet device, and you can have, and we do enforce it, is backup words on paper. So mm -hmm. it's randomly cryptographically generated words that you would print out and, or write down and store in a very secure place that if you do need to recover or access in case you lose your primary and secondary or third or fourth device, and you can mm -hmm. onboard with as many as you want, uh, you can even have a friend or a family member be a backup. Um, you know, you can basically, within practicality, you know, shard into infinity, but uh, there, there are backups and mechanisms in place. But... Okay. You know, from a purist standpoint, you want that, right? Because you don't want to rely on that central authority. You don't want to be able to call out a comment and say, hey, I lost my password. Can you reset it? Right. Right. You well, don't I don't. Want I'm to sure that there are people who still prefer that. But yeah, I'm, I'm not the type then of person. They're, they're not going to be happy with our solution because we don't have that. That's <laughs> yeah. not an option, right? Yeah, and yeah. if you don't onboard the right way, you could be you know stuck in that SOL situation where you can't get it, gain access to your encrypted data. We can't help you. Yeah, it's like it's like saying I want to speak to the CEO of Bitcoin. <laughs> just... I've met him. He's a nice guy. <laughs> uh -huh, that's great. Um, good. I mean, like, I think there needs to be redundancies in place. Obviously, you you've you've thought about that already and have some options. Um, uh, all of which sound uh, pretty useful. So that's great. Uh, apparently, Atacama signed a, st a strategic partnership with Nth Generation uh, this past spring. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So uh, we are in the software uh, space, what's known as a channel first company. And what that means is we don't sell directly. Mm -hmm. So if you're an individual, you can go on our website, you know, download the software, right? And start using it. Um, and we encourage that and it's free, right? You don't have to pay for it um, because at the end of the day, people should protect their files. And there's a lot of apathy out there, unfortunately. And people should not be apathetic when it comes to their privacy and security. Right. But on the, uh, the the enterprise side, we don't sell directly. So we have a sales team and the sales team is there primarily to speak to customers and show showcase the software, do demos, things of that nature. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, companies that want to actually buy the software, they go to their resellers, right? So right. and being a strategic CDW. partner of ours. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and when we have, you know, distributors and these resellers and what's interesting about resellers like end generation is, you know, they're squarely focused on cyber and information security. So mm -hmm. from a strategic standpoint, their mindset is aligned. And when they come in and speak to their respective customers, they know which products the customer would benefit from. And they see, you know, the value add in a product like ours, as opposed to, you know, some other resellers that sell, you know, anything and everything and don't have that laser focus on cyber and information security. Cool. Good. Sounds like a, sounds like a perfect partner for you. Hopefully the, that, uh, that has been going well and continues to go well. So <clears throat> hmm. I'm curious if you know of, um, without naming names or any, or anything like that, maybe somebody has, has come to you and been like, Oh my goodness. Thank, thank, thank goodness. We had Atacama in place because X, Y, Z, you know, a attack or social engineering attempt just happened. Do you have any stories, uh, uh, that you've gotten, you know, feedback from especially business customers? I imagine there are yeah. quite a few of them who are, who have sensitive data. They, they want to protect or, or even individual, indiv maybe a yeah. high net worth individual who's like, just had something very secret that they wanted to protect. So no, the answer is no. And that's only because we started selling our software earlier this year, right? Okay. And in, in a way it started, you know, uh, as much as it can flying off the shelves. But I will tell you the following. We've had much success for better or for worse with companies that have just been hit. And mm. they're in the process of identifying, you know, products that can remediate or can fill certain gaps. So a lot of it is a post-mortem that they've undertaken, either on their own or in conjunction with a consultant that comes in to identify those gaps and, and issues that need to be resolved. And we've actually closed a handful of deals in less than two days uh, oh, because wow. the company needed something urgently to be able to continue to operate, needed something urgently to be able to obtain insurance coverage, because mm -hmm. if they don't have you know, that stopgap, they, they can't get cyber. 
uh, insurance. And so that those handful of deals, uh, we have a short sales cycle to begin with, but you know, a magnitude of several days, that's unheard of. Yeah. Um, and you know, these companies basically, and you should see it, right. They, 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 that light bulb goes off, right. We, we demo the software and right away they're like, OMG, I wish I had this a week ago. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it's kind of one of those things where when we're selling and prospectively trying to tell people, don't be in a situation where it's going to be, I told you so. It's not a matter of if you're going to get hacked. It's a matter of when you're going to get hacked and you need something like this. You know, a lot of people throw words around like zero trust, security in depth. But what I've seen in my experience, unfortunately, a lot of folks just uh, are very superficial when it comes to their cyber coverage and their programs. And uh, they have a tendency to check the box. So we started this conversation by talking about full disk encryption, right? And believe it or not, you'd be surprised how often I hear from people saying, uh, I, I got encryption covered. I've, I've got BitLocker. And I'm saying to myself, man, you know, yeah, I'm not going to disparage BitLocker. Like I said, it does serve a purpose. But do you really realize that if you get, you know, hacked, like nothing's encrypted, you need to appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and the folks that, you know, after the fact, you know, there, but for the grace of God, um, you know, those are the people that are more attuned and now they see it for what it is. It's like, oh my God, I wish I had this. So yeah. unfortunately, you know, let, let's talk in six months and I'm sure I'll have, you know, a few, uh, sound bites that I can share with you where, you know, folks can actually, um, you know, highlight the fact and tout that we delivered on our security guarantees. Uh, but right now, um, you know. The best I can do is tell you that, you know, companies that have been whacked, love it, love the solution after the fact, unfortunately. Yeah, well, I mean, it's better than nothing. It's better than than leaving it as is or or trying to pretend it didn't happen. Uh, I was up until last December 2020 uh, on my um, municipalities council, uh, you know, like a city council type thing. And uh, and. Every other week, it felt like another municipality was getting hit by uh, right. by uh, uh, malware, which was encrypting everything, and you'd have to pay Bitcoin or Monero or something to get to get the keys back. Or if you had a competent uh, uh, IT department, <clears throat> they're restoring from the most recent backup, which hopefully is the day before, uh, and you've you've lost almost. And nothing. hopefully, it's offline. It hopefully it's offline because you know yeah. the, the smarter attackers are going to go straight for those backups if they're on. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, offsite, offline, you know, completely different location tapes if you have to, <laughs> because, yeah. cause they'll still have super high capacity and, and are Worm, fairly inexpensive Worm. compared to, uh, you know, four terabyte SSDs or something like that. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a nightmare. Like it was like, oh my God, like when is, when is middle sex center going to get hit? And, uh, uh, I don't recall it happening at the time, but, um, so certainly if it did, it wasn't a big deal which was nice, but, um, yeah, you know, these things, these things happen. Um, I don't remember the last time I had any sort of major issue personally, but I know my email address at the very least is included in all sorts of data breaches. Thanks to oh, services like have I been pwned, which, you know, eventually led me to, to finally instituting a password manager and literally just like, yep, 24 characters, <laughs> numbers, yep. letters, pa symbols, etc. I have, I know like three or four of my passwords out of the, you know, hundreds that, it, that I, that I have yeah. everything else. Passwords, password are broken. Manager, passwords which, are broken. Yeah. Which has two FA on it as well and, and everything else. So yeah, it's, uh, you, you can't take this. You, I don't think you could take it too seriously. There's, there's a point of paranoia that you probably don't need to go beyond, but, uh, but especially when, you know, Atacama, it, it looks like is available for free or super inexpensive for individuals. Like there's really no reason not to, at least for that really, really sensitive stuff that you don't want uh, yeah. getting out there. So, yeah, I think we had that line on our website at some point. There's no reason not to encrypt. <laughs> yeah, I, except for the the very minor inconvenience of, oh, yes, I'm trying to open that file and, you know, tapping the tapping the button on your phone. But, um, you know, for, for what it gets you, I think that's that's well worth it. Uh, so. You guys have come this far. What are you What are you looking to to do next? Are you looking to add more features and functionality? Are you looking to beef up the uh, the encryption algorithm just because you can? Um, what, what's What's Atacama working on next? Without maybe dropping too much, leaking too much yeah. alpha for your competitors. 
Yeah, you know, we have a feature roadmap that's, uh, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of old school speak here, but remember when we had the, um, uh, you know, the white pages, the, the phone book, uh, that, that's yeah. about as thick as our feature. We, we have lively debates <laughs> every day, you know, about which features we're going to prioritize. The good news is now, you know, we have uh, a lot of customers that we can turn to and actually send them surveys to see mm -hmm. which feature set, you know, they would appreciate. So one of the things that we've actually built out and it's going to go uh, live in a meaningful way. It's available now. Like if you, you know, downloaded the software, you'd, you'd be able to use it, but secure file transfer. And instead of sending the file, um, you know, with a password, for example, you're just sending someone a link. And mm -hmm. once you verify that party, you've established a secure key exchange with that party. And you just send them links to the files that you're sending them and they're being transmitted to that party, you know, from point A to point B encrypted and the person is able to decrypt them in their web browser. And so we're gonna beef up that feature to allow, for example, things like read only, where it would just be a visual you know, rendering oh. of the file in the web browser, um, expiring that link so that you know, they, they can't do anything with it after the fact, um, watermarks, things of that nature, right? And a lot of what we do is beef up our existing feature set, which is really important. And, uh, you know, like it, it's funny during COVID, a lot of our uh, business customers started moving to Teams, Microsoft Teams and SharePoint and all things Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, every question we got was, you know, do you guys work with SharePoint? Do you guys work with SharePoint? And we were like scratching our heads like, what, what's going on? And then we, it dawned on us. It was so obvious. Everyone's remote and it's such a productivity yeah. tool where you can share files, collaborate on files, do everything, uh, you know, in SharePoint together. Um, and we do support a lot of the functionality there. But one of the big things we're likely going to do at some point is to address Google Docs, right? So if you think mm. of G Drive, you know, the, that suite, I love it from a productivity standpoint, the fact that you and I thousands of miles you know, away from each other can pop open a file and concurrently you know, edit that file, that, yeah. that's kick ass. I mean, I love that functionality. But as we all know, you know, uh, the Google verse is reading our content and that sucks. Um, so with our solution, actually what we're going to be able to do is if you and I are both out of comma users, you and I can see the content, but for everyone else in the world, including the Google people, uh, it's going to be encrypted gibberish. So that's pretty darn cool and something we're going to address, uh, that is very you know, cool. meaningfully. Yeah. All right. That sounds, that sounds terrific. Looking forward to, to seeing that, uh, get released. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the ITAR end to end encryption rule is. Your thoughts on it and, and what it actually means for data security at the end of the day. Well, thank you for that throwaway question there. You know, who doesn't <laughs> want to talk about ITAR? Um, but, uh, you know, it, ITAR is a meaningful um, regulatory requirement for anyone doing business with the federal government. Um, and um, I think it stands for international trafficking and arms or something or other. I tried. I used to know to what it said, what it stood on. for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But in, in a nutshell, it, it, it basically said, and, and what's so selfishly from a vendor standpoint, what I love about ITAR is unlike most other regulations where, you know, you can potentially get a slap on the wrist or some kind of, uh, you know, financial um, uh, penalty that you have to pay, et cetera. With ITAR, it's criminal charges. So if you mm -hmm. violate that rule, you know, there's potential that you go to prison. And the monetary penalties, we're talking about, you know, like seven figures, right? So it's really meaningful. And so when we speak to companies that are working with the government and um, it really has to, it, it deals with the ex export of data. So what they don't want happening is if you are tasked as a government vendor, right? You're working with the government and the government has shared certain confidential information with you. Um, what they want to uh, prevent is, you know, rogue nation states gaining access to that information right and so um you know companies that need to comply with itar there's just this incredibly heightened sense of urgency around it and need to comply and um you know we weren't very familiar with itar up until recently because we, we got a bunch of inbounds from government contractors and they were like um i need your product because i need to comply with itar and this is like amazing because now i can check a lot of boxes when I'm filling out that due diligence questionnaire, which is, you know, a, a nightmare, right? Um, yeah. From, you know, like it's bureaucratic insanity. I've been through them. Um, it's, it's not fun. Yeah, it's not fun. Um, but, uh, you know, so with our solution, a lot of these companies feel a lot better about being able to affirmatively tell the government that, yes, we are ITAR compliant. Mm. So. 
Fair enough. Uh, and yes, I think I think you're right. It does mean international traffic in arms regulations. Yeah. Um, in, in that former life working at Infotech Research Group, I ended up working with uh, James Quinn, who was the head of information security research or whatever we called it at the time. And, uh, and so I, I got deep in ITAR and HIPAA and PIPEDA and a bunch of other things at the time. But that is literally 10 plus years ago. <laughs> so yeah. it's uh, it's mostly left uh, left my brain. But uh, yeah, no, that's that's really important. I've also got a friend who runs an IT services company here locally, and uh, and I know he's had to jump through similar hoops to work with the Canadian government and the Canadian yeah. military, or to work with clients who are working with the Canadian military, and right. uh, and so he's been through a lot of this, the Canadian version uh, of similar regu regulation and legislation, and having to jump through those hoops and comply with all these different things, and even. Um, it was probably mostly a joke at the time, but uh, uh, ISO 27001, uh, you know, yeah. having to go through at least at the very least. Yeah, we've got that in place. Yes, we have, we have this policy yeah. in place. We don't have to assess how good the policy is, but we have yeah. you know these policies in place. And, you know, this this sort of thing is among them. A, a quick aside, I'm just wondering how. <clears throat> I, again, be, just because I've got all this all this time spent doing research ten ish years ago, uh, it doesn't seem a lot of, like a lot of people talk about data loss prevention solutions anymore. Uh, uh, what were they yeah. called? Um, data discovery classification. Yeah, that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, intrusion yeah. prevention, intrusion intrusion detection yeah. systems. Like, I I think Atacama solution works really well along them. But I'm, especially in in the realm of DLP, you know, data loss prevention yeah. solutions, I'm just wondering, like, is that still part of uh, the conversation? Or and their and businesses are getting Atacama's file level encryption in addition to DLP, or are they trying to replace what, especially on prem, can be a very beefy, expensive box yeah. that's literally, uh, uh, you know, s slowing down your network because everything going out to the web has to go through that box. Um, yeah. Like where, where is Atacama fitting into the, into the, into the solution stack, especially with large enterprises like that or, or very sensitive enterprises? Yeah. So DLP, you know, if you look at the origins of DLP, it was really to prevent data leakage by your authorized users, right? So yeah. something as simple as not being able to download a file locally on your machine, something yeah. as simple as so not being drive. able to plug an external drive into your machine. Exactly. DLP is really morphed, and a lot of people talk about DLP as almost like, you know, 80% of their cyber tech stack. And DLP includes things that, you know, sometimes we, we have to catch ourselves when we're talking to people and kind of say, is that really DLP? You know, so DLP is really morphed uh, to, you know, preventing, um, you know, internal users from being able to access certain information, gating, if you will, right? Um, containerizing, um, preventing... Um, you know, the ability for users to gain access to certain systems. So all of these different, you know, functions that are being solved by what I would describe as tools that are not traditionally DLP, but kind of thrown into that DLP bucket, same as us. Uh, because yeah. when people see our solution, we definitely have these secondary characteristics that look and feel like DLP. And while you can, in fact, accomplish a lot of these traditional DLP functionality, uh, with our solution, that's not what we're designed for, right? And we make that clear. We're like, look, you yeah. could use it for this thing, right? Like preventing a certain user from being able to access the encrypted data, but that's not what we designed the software to do, mm -hmm. right? We designed the software singularly to prevent unauthorized third parties from being able to access anything. Now, if you decide that that third party is in a different department, sure, you <laughs> could do that, but that's really, yeah. um, you know, not 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 the core functionality. So that being said we do sometimes get thrown into that DLP bucket. Um, I still think DLP is a thing, but, uh, but unfortunately, a lot of people kind of, you know, uh, you know it's morphed, right? And, and, and people confuse it or conflate it with other solutions. Um, and and it's, it's a really good question from the standpoint of there's no standards, right? Like something as simple as cybersecurity and information security, right? A lot of people use those terms interchangeably. I think that's a huge mistake. I view information security as a subset of the cybersecurity tech stack. And that's important because if you think of cybersecurity as that castle wall that prevents mm -hmm. the attacker from gaining access to the inside of the, uh, of the wall, um, right? You make the wall really thick. You make that moat really deep. 
yeah. right? Um, that's cybersecurity, preventing the attacker from gaining access to your systems and your network. But what, what, what happens when they get in? How are you preventing them from being able to access the crown jewels that are being safeguarded within that castle? That's information security. Mm -hmm. And security practitioners that don't, you know, identify the differences and don't focus on the differences and don't have proper products in place within their overall stack that addresses those differences is going to suffer devastating results. They will. Because if you're relying on information security, right, or relying on tools for your information security that are the same as your uh, cybersecurity, simple example, identity and access management controls or 2FA, right? If you're saying to yourself, that 2FA, that multi-factor is going to prevent the attacker from getting in, and therefore it is also my information security strategy, well, guess what? Once that pillar collapses, now your information security is susceptible to, to the same attack as your cybersecurity stack, and that's no good. Right. So you have to have products in place that address that information security component of your overall security design. I think it sounds like Twitch should have had something like this in place. <laughs> well, I got to see that video. You got to send that to me. Um, I, I just yeah, I mean, once you're once you're beyond the castle walls, if you can if you can roam around the network, you know, willingly for weeks, months, years, it doesn't, it doesn't matter then what your cybersecurity uh, stack looked like because somebody got past it and now they're just, mm -hmm. you know, walking around your castle, pretending to be one of you yeah. and, and slowly, you know, uh, one megabit per second at a time, exfiltrating all this data. Um, and, and Twitch is not the first uh, example. I, I think it, you know, sounds like that was probably the case to get a hundred and 100 and something gigs at least out 120 something gigs um we've seen this before all all, all sorts of uh, situations where somebody was literally in the network for weeks or months uh if not 18 plus months and and therefore was able to learn a whole lot about an organization and and view security cameras and and exfiltrate data and stuff like that because there was nothing stop there was no other doors or gates once exactly. you're past yeah. once you're past the moat once you're through the gate you're you you had free range or free reign and yeah. so you know and yeah. that it's obviously a very bad idea at the same time you need a strong wall like you said and you need that information security i'm even thinking to myself like oh god i really got to pay for that pro plan on this one thing i have and and get that extra level security because a i can afford it now and b it's worth it because of the 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 stuff I have on this MacBook Pro and on my phone and elsewhere, um, exactly. So yeah, all right. I think we have time for one more question here, and, and I will throw it to you uh, about uh, where you see digital privacy and human rights being five years from now. We're we getting better. We're we getting worse. Are we in a stalemate? What what are your what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, I view that question as a double edged sword, or, or the issue I should say is a double edged sword. And, and here's what I mean. You know, we're, we're definitely more mobile as a society um, and technology is leaps and bounds ahead of what we as individuals are capable of comprehending, right? We walk around literally with handheld computers in our hands, right? These, these things are so powerful. Now we're using, they are supercomputers, right? The power on these phones is exponentially greater than what man flew to the moon on, right? They traveled to the moon with computers that were a joke, right? Compared to what we have now. Yeah. Um, now we're using it for social media primarily, right? But there's so much more that we can do with these devices. And because of the proliferation, right? Um, if you look at the numbers, uh, you know, I think everyone's going to have a smartphone, you know, within a very short period of time, including, you know, developing nations. Um, what that does is it creates this situation where we become our digital selves, right? Like I can walk into my bank. I have a bank account, right? Mm -hmm. I have to prove to them I am who I am. And it's very difficult to do that if you think about it. Whereas if I log in online, the recognition is that much clearer to them because they're not looking at me as an individual because that's yeah. becoming the atypical way of interacting with ourselves, right? So our digital selves are more legitimate, quote unquote, than our physical selves. Because if I lost my wallet and I walked into a bank and I said, I am Dmitry Nemirovsky. They would not care an iota. I'd say, here, yeah. take a blood sample. Here's my fingerprint. Right? Here's <laughs> yeah. a urine sample. Whatever you guys need, um, they wouldn't care. 
right? But if I log into a machine right next to that person and enter my login credentials because I happen to remember them, I'm good, yeah. right? So that's the double-edged sword. And I, and I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a revolution of sorts where we as humans will demand greater control of our own digital selves, our own identities. And whether that's somehow, you know, uh, you know with our actual devices, or a combination of those devices or some other form. You know, what scares what scares me is biometrics. And here's why biometrics scares me. Um, it's, it's fairly straightforward. I'm not going to say easy, but it's fairly straightforward to reset your credentials. I can change your username. I can change an email. I can change a password, right? Yeah. Those are interchangeable. I can't change my thumbprint. I can't change my face. I can't change my, you know, retina. And the more we're relying on those biometrics, you know, it, securing those is not trivial. And who has access to those is not tri trivial. And if one of my biometrics is compromised, I'm done. I'm yeah. not, I can't reset my thumbprint. I can't reset my retina. I can maybe go to a plastic surgeon and change my face, but I, do I really want to do that? Maybe. Yeah. I don't and who's going to pay for it? Kids want me to do that. Who's going to pay for that, right? But that's kind of crazy that you have to Life you know, go to reconstructive <laughs> surgery. Yeah, LifeLock. Yeah, you get two plastic surgeries this this quarter because Target was hacked. But uh, no, it's a real issue. Um, you know, th there's definitely benefits to what we're seeing in that digital, uh, you know, um, space uh, for individuals, mm -hmm. all of us. But the, the risks are also there. And I think we it's incumbent upon us as individuals to be mindful of it and not be apathetic. And understand that our privacy is us now, right? You wouldn't want to let anyone into your home just because. And there's like yeah. commercials now around that, right? Um, it's the same with our digital selves. That fingerprint, that footprint that we're leaving behind, that's us. And we need to really be aware of it and more mindful of it as we, you know, move forward as a species. Yeah. Yeah. Even... The convenience factors, you know, could be amazing for, for allowing... A grocery store a hotel to know a little bit more about you and, and obviously if you walk under their premise and they've got cameras you know you're you're accepting certain terms and and you know i, I think most of us are aware of that but i i've i've gone really back and forth with literally you know 20 years ago i was sitting in a in my apartment being like oh my god it would be so amazing if i could just walk into superstore real canadian superstore local grocery firm um uh put everything in my cart and then just walk out yeah. done. Right. You're good. You, you, you can scan RFID tags on the, on the products you can, or maybe I need to scan my credit card on the way out, whatever. But like, this could be so much easier than, uh, um, uh, standing in line for yeah. five, 10, 20 minutes, an hour, you know, close to Thanksgiving or Christmas and, uh, and waiting for a cashier to, to get to me or, or waiting for the self checkout, whatever. Amazon, you know, is literally putting this in the place. And I'm and I'm That's sure right. some European firms too. I don't want to give them all the credit. Um and I use Amazon and I'm an Amazon Prime member and and but at least I'm cognizant of the fact of of how much data I'm giving them. Mm -hmm. Um because I use their platform similar to Netflix. I watch a show, I tell you I like it, you give me more shows like that. I understand that trade-off even though I'm literally paying for the privilege. Um on the on the and of course, I, th I think many people have this dream of, you know, walking into a building and people like, oh, hello, Mr. Silva. Like, we just know who right. you are because you're such a valued customer or, or what have you. On the one hand, it'd be really nice to have that at a, at a bank or a hotel or even an airline. Like, yeah, you know me because I'm important. On the other hand, how you get to that point is, is starting to get really scary, mostly because of where are you storing that data? Who get has yeah. access to that data, et cetera. And if it does get breached, Twitch style, you know, gigabytes or terabytes of, of data getting getting out there, and you could potentially make a really convincing uh, uh, facsimile of some kind that could bypass yeah. a lot of security protections, especially if it's for somebody who's actually famous. Um, right. That could remember that Tom, that that Tom Cruise movie where uh, he gets the eye transplant and he walks into a Gap store. Is that Minority Report? Minority Report, thank you. Okay. When he walks yes. into the Gap store and the Gap, you know, it's, it's the future and they basically says, well, hello, Mr. Nakamura or whatever it was. It was a Japanese <laughs> name because they scanned his retina, right? And they yeah. recognized him as someone else. Uh, or um, Her, the uh, Joaquin Phoenix yes. and Scarlett yeah. Johansson uh, movie. On the one hand, 
wow, super cool. Yeah. Like, yeah, it'd be nice to be able to just talk so naturally with your virtual assistant. On the other hand, I, I remember a scene where he's walking down the street and because facial recognition, retina recognition, whatever, you know, something is scanning him. All of a sudden he's getting super targeted ads that I think only he can see on, on billboards. And I'm like, okay, that would be really creepy. Like, exactly. Like, yes. Okay. Right. It's targeted. So it's, it's probably something you want, but on the other hand, you know exactly what I want. And, and you were able to identify me because of something I had no control over just because I'm That's not right. wearing a mask or I'm not wearing sunglasses. You were able to scan my face or my eyes or whatever. And now you're showing me very, very targeted uh, yeah. ads on the, like on a public street like that to me, that's uh, uh, several steps too far. So yeah. a little bit um, intrusive, very, very intrusive. Well, it sounds like we're on the same page there. Uh, I, I, we didn't get into it, but I, I, it sounds like we could have had a debate about decentralization and how much is good and how much is not. Uh, but I think we'll have to save that for for another time. Uh, Dimitri, if if people want a little bit le learn a little bit more about yourself or about Atacama, where should they go? You can visit us at www.atacama with a k dot com. That's a t a k a m a. Uh, if you want to email us, you can email us at info at atacama dot com. Uh, to learn more about the product. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm at Dimitri, D-I-M-I-T-R-I at atacama.com. Cool. Terrific. Thank you so much for, for your time today. Hopefully everybody enjoyed listening. And until next time, stay free. Thank you.